You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Scripture, the final frontier. These are the discussions of the Prophet Pearls podcast. It's one year mission to explore challenging verses, to seek out common ground and understanding, to boldly go where no Methodist and Karate have gone before. That's you it. To add the, you to add, <laughs> Wait, can we add in that music? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you think about this stuff? Like, like you sit I down do. And write this. Or, well, no. Man, I was wow. I was driving in the car somewhere, and and this came to me, and I'm like, this is it. We're tr- you know, this, this is my intro. Keith is a shalom chaverim shali. That, that's your yeah, thing. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now this is your thing. That well, it's good, and you get this for a few more weeks, and then after that, we can go back and forth because we're going to be together again. Why are we going to be together? <sighs> because we're Thank taking God. the chance. What do we, let's see. Today, I think we started an hour ago. That, it's about well, about forty-five minutes. Actually, and we're actually, just now getting no. I think. Oh yeah, it was an hour ago. Yeah, forty-five minutes ago. About an hour ago. So, folks, um, please bear with us. We're trying to <sighs> we're trying to put this together. Uh, we're we're do, we're trying to do our recordings. And then, for those who don't know, we're going to be meeting together in the land of the prophets in Israel, so that we can be together like we were for the first ten episodes, and record together. Prophet Pearls, and I think it's significant that we're going to be at the place where the prophet spoke. We're a lot of the places. You know, and, and isn't this a picture of Amos three three, the verse that's that is translated in the King James? Can two walk together? Uh, how does it in the King James? Uh, mm-hmm. Unless they agree. Yeah. Unless they agree, right? In the Hebrew, it's mm-hmm. can two walk together without having met one another? <laughs> Yeah. And we just can't even have this conversation unless we meet on the common ground of no. of the internet and Skype and 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 the the government where you are is, isn't having it and and the internet infrastructure i have <laughs> i am is i'm actually right now out in the on the olympic peninsula in the only as far as i understand this is the only non-tropical rainforest in the world and it doesn't have hmm. the best internet where i am a place called squim wow and so where are you squim i'm in squim. yeah and i'm, I'm in around. i'm in Shant- well actually right now this week while while you all are listening to this i am still in the bush of africa and on my way back uh, to ch- to China for a, you know it's interesting we're doing like what's a, what's called a Far East Middle East uh, I don't use I don't like to use the word mission I would say it's an initiative and the doors are flinging open we'll talk about that later but I'm actually in this part of the world you're in that part of the world and now we're going to try to to look into the Book of Jeremiah which I have yeah. been looking forward to this this is a this is an interesting this is an interesting uh, section that we're going to look at but I do have a question yeah. before we get started. Now I, I'm just checking on this. Uh, is it your understanding that it's it's that it's uh, Jeremiah 34 8 through 22, and then Jeremiah 33 25 and 26? That's is, correct. Is that your yeah. understanding? Yeah, that's correct. And so, okay. And so, do we do we get to start with 33 25 through 26? Well, I mean, we, we should do it, and we should end with it. And and I mean, I think we've talked about this in the past. And here so, it's actually really. So you're going to tell really, me we're going to go backwards. Yeah. We're going to we're going to read the first part and then go backwards. Ken and jump back and forth. of course. Oh, okay. All, All right. right, but okay. but um, you know, so why did they do that? And we've talked about in the past that that um, you know, you have the situation, and we could talk about it like in general, but but meaning like why is it that you know in the past that we had, they plucked two verses like a few chapters later, and it was so they could end on a good note, and here they chose the last two verses, um, which are actually should be the first two verses. In other words, chronologically, like you're like you're saying. It goes Jeremiah thirty three twenty five and twenty six, and then the following verse is Jeremiah thirty four one. And what they did is they put the last two verses at the end to end on a good note because the end of thirty four isn't really. A I'm good not note. buying this whole thing anymore. I mean this no. this whole thing about switching and grabbing certain verses and putting. Look, we're doing this. We're going by what the what the reading is. But I have to tell you, I mean it's a little frustrating. Like when you're you're in a passage and then they cut that part and then go to yeah. another part and then go to. I mean, that's what they do. This is for the year, and we're going to do that. But for me, I, what I love about reading Scripture in context, and I think that's, I would say by far, in terms of interpretation, it is probably, short of the language, mm-hmm. context has got to be right there. I mean, as far as the most important issue. Like, if you don't have context, and you can just pull a verse here and put it there, and how do you want it to, it just, uh, it gets real confusing. And, yeah. and I don't think, and I think that that's the whole point of, mm-hmm. of Scripture, is that is that it's also, it's written in context. And what was the situation Jeremiah was in versus Isaiah versus Ezekiel versus, you yeah. know, in Kings when we're reading, you know, we have to, we have to add that to the, uh, to the, yeah. to the mix. Well, context is obviously, you know, key. That's what I've been talking about for for decades, which is you know, 
understanding scripture based on the, the you know history, the language and the context, the cultural context, the historical context, the, the language. I mean, that, that, that's really from my earliest uh, interaction with the whole oral law thing. My problem mm-hmm. with the rabbis that I had is that they were taking things out of context and just simply mm-hmm. reading them in context. And, and so here's an example. It was probably perhaps rabbis who came up with this section and and put these last two. So I, I'll accept that. If you want to start with verses 25 and 26, of Jer- I, I accept that. Let's do it. Oh, I you've con- that you've convinced it, me. Okay, right, I'd like. So can I can I read 35, 33, 25, and twenty six? And before we get just started, I'm, I'm really ex- yeah. excited about this. Our prophet pro partner is uh, Sven Brown, and and, and Sven uh, was in Germany actually when we did this. Now he's in in Colorado, and uh, and I'm giving his whole name. And the reason I'm giving his whole name is that this guy, he and his wife Tina, have been so significant to not only this process but to so many things that have been going on. And the idea was is that he would be able to to give us uh, comments, questions, and we'd be able to respond to them i've reached out to him he happens to be a pilot that flies around the world so he's probably he might even be in this part of the world and so he hasn't been able to get back to us and so what i'm going to ask him to do as we've asked a number of people to do um, because of this logistic technical problem we're not within the schedule we're ahead of schedule hopefully to be able to get something recorded so that it'll be available on the date that it comes up so i'm going to ask him to do uh, what we ask some other folks to do, and that's to write in our comment sections at um, NehemiahsWall.com and BFAInternational.com his comments regarding this passage. It was a passage that he selected, he was excited about, and it's supposed to be uh, recorded in mid-February, but it's January because we're going to see if we can even get it done. <laughs> so, Sven, be patient with us, but we want to hear your comments and your questions. Thank you for being a partner and for all those that, uh, that are doing that. But uh, he, he did pick this section, so let's look at 33, 25, and uh, and twenty six and, and yeah. can I read it from the NIV? Please. Okay, this is what the Lord, capital L O R D Yehovah, says: If I have not established my covenant with day and night, and the fixed laws of heaven and earth, man, I love this verse. I, can I can I steal one of your lines here? This I'm really sure is <laughs> the next the next the next verse. This really is one of my favorite verses, just because of what it says. We've already says, heard there are fifty Yehovah favorite says. verses. I don't know. No, no, you got. I'm just saying this is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not established uh, my covenant with day and night and the fixed laws of heaven and earth. Then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes. And I think it, it says here, uh, well, that, I'll bring that's them back. That's what you got. I'll restore your fortunes. No, 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 no. They have a, they have a note here in the NIV. Oh. It also says, or we'll bring them back from captivity. I will bring back their captivity. Not or it says that. Ashiva Shutam. I will bring back their captivity. So you're saying yeah, the NIV yeah. didn't didn't want the Jews coming back to Israel because that's not politically no, no, correct. No, 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 no. They put the note there. They they put they the note that there the saying that. That's a, yeah, Come it's on. in the footnote. Yep, restore I will bring, I will restore their their fortunes, Give me a break. Yeah. Or, or bring them back their activity and have compassion on them. Now, why is this one of my favorite verses? Why? Just because I think sometimes the circumstance when I when I'm whether I'm here or over the years and I look at the news and I hear about what's happening, um, sometimes it is it is overwhelming in negativity and it's overwhelming. And I guess I can't understand why you always want to finish on a good note. But I say let's start on a good note. And and the good note here in scripture is that this is something. That he's going to do and he's going to that he's, you know, he says, I've, I've got to deal with the heavens and the earth. I mean, we, we, we got an understanding. And he says, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed laws of heaven, in other words, as those fixed laws work, that's that's a situation well, what are the fixed where there's laws an we're talking about. Well, I'm looking at the fixed laws of how how the how, how the laws of the universe work. Right. I mean, whether it's the sun that rises or, uh, you know, the 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 way that the planets and the earth go around. Well, and the, the, re- the reason I ask yeah. that, and the reason I think it's important to state, is that there are definitely some people historically and even today who have said there are no laws of nature. In fact, every time you throw a rock up in the air and it comes back down, that's a miracle that God is performing. And that's kind of true, but the miracle is that He's sustaining the universe by establishing these laws and 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 keeping them in force. Um, and and so there are definitely laws of nature, but He created those laws of nature, and it's really interesting that today. There are physicists, and, and, and I know your son, who's like a, a science guy, he probably knows more about this than I do, but there are physicists today who, who have looked at the universe, the laws of physics, and they say that that these laws are they're too eloquent, they're too, they, they work too well. They're, they say, what are the odds that the universe would have these laws? It, it makes no sense. And so they've come up with this theory that there's an infinite number of universes, and we just by coincidence happen to be sitting in the universe where the laws of nature allow for life to exist and for, you know, for the laws of physics to, to work 
Um, but all the other universes, they're they're not so. Um, what's the word? They they don't work so well. And um, yeah. you know, and and so it, you know, it seems to me like we we have this worldwide movement today to deny Israel's right to their land, to deny Israel's covenant with the Creator of the universe. And I think that I believe that goes hand in hand with people denying that He is the Creator of the universe, that He has established mm-hmm. these laws. If you deny mm-hmm. His, and that's exactly what these verses are saying, just as true as He establishes these laws, and these laws will continue forever. And as long as the universe exists, so too will his covenant with Israel continue, and he will uh, he will restore their captivity and have mercy upon them. Mm, amen. And isn't this you know, a great so example? Uh, so go ahead. So, yeah. So, no, so, no. So, what sure. I was going to say is that, is that you, you, you sometimes uh, they focus on the end. Like, okay, yeah. so for example, you talked about the covenant with Israel and Israel's right to 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 a God given promised uh, land. And so people would focus on that and say, well, it can't be because of this, 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 this. But really, I think you, you tapped into something really interesting. You, touch, you touched a nerve. Hmm. And the nerve is, well, we can't take that serious because that promise is based on this God who we, won't, who we don't want to acknowledge, mm-hmm. who's given his word and his will and his way. We can't acknowledge that. So we can't acknowledge Israel's covenant with this God because we can't acknowledge this God because we – I mean it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. But ultimately, isn't it all about – is there a God, a creator of the universe who did what you just talked about, designed this amazing universe? And to acknowledge that design is to acknowledge him, and we can't acknowledge him. Right. I mean, it's, it's like the, the denial of him, and that's why the whole issue with Israel, Israel is so important. You know, Sometimes people focus on the political issue and say, well, here's why that can't be. There's, there's got to be a two-state solution because of this, that, and the other. We don't want to hear about covenants and promises and creators and – you know, our father, that's, that's not something that we want to focus on. Well, and and then, you know, one of the things I'll hear from these, these um, people who are against Israel and they'll say, Oh, you know, you people, you came from, you, you know, you came from Russia. And and in my case, legitimately, you can say my great grandfather came from Lithuania, but that wasn't his homeland. His homeland was Israel. And that's why I've come back. And, And that's what it means here. When it says I will return their captivity, my great grandfather, he was a captive in Lithuania. Um, you know, and, and so God brought us back from captivity and now people are saying, Oh no, get back to captivity. That's where you belong. That's where they want us in captivity. They cannot, they, they, they can't stomach this, that, that the Jews have been restored to their land and that, and that the covenant still stands just as the stars in heaven are there and then the sun rises and, 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 and sets and, um, and, and, you know, and we were talking about context, Jeremiah thirty three twenty six is a great verse, especially in the NIV that if we wanted to, you know, illustrate what it means to take something out of context. So obviously verse 25 sets it up and then verse 26 opens with then let's take out the word then. And, and if we take out the, the word, then we can read the verse. I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant. And will not choose one of his sons to rule over the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I Meaning, you could do that if you want to take things out of context. This is why context is so important. Exactly. You know, someone once exactly. pointed out that it says in the Bible there is no God. Of course, the full verse says the fool says in his heart there is no God. But I can show you those words. There is no God in the Bible <laughs> if I take it out of context. Yeah. And this is Isn't what people this is what people like to do. Uh, I want to point out two really interesting things about this passage. One is that we have the name Isaac here is unique. It uh, doesn't appear this way anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, it's Yitzchak with a tzadi, and here it's Yitzchak with a sin. Um, those are two different letters in Hebrew. They sound a little bit similar. They're made from a similar part of the mouth, um, but they are different. And so it's interesting here that he says Yitzchak, and is there something to that? Um, Yitzchak is he will laugh. Yitzchak is he will play. I don't mm-hmm. know that there's anything to it, but maybe there, maybe somebody can come to the website, nehemiaswall.com or, or your website, Keith, and they can share in the comments maybe an explanation of why it would be he, the name would be here. He will play instead of he will laugh. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, so now, one, yeah, one more thing about this passage. So one one of the controversies that I'll hear a lot about in 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 um, you know the especially from Christians and Messianics and Hebrew roots people, not all of them, but there's a certain segment of them who they're just not comfortable with the, with the Hebrew Bible. They, there's this Greek translation of the, of the Tanakh called the Septuagint. And they're much more comfortable with that. They don't really want to acknowledge the, the Hebrew Bible. Um, they'll say that I, I, we even, we've even encountered some of these people who I, I think probably are extreme, but they've actually said that Hebrew Bible is anti Yeshua. You know what I'm talking about, right? There are mm-hmm. people who have said that, um, and then said, and then we're like, okay, so what do you, 
if you, you're rejecting the word of God, no, no, I accept the word of God, they'll say, but we want to use the Greek text. Oh, okay. So mm-hmm. can you, do you have a Septuagint there, Keith, by any chance? You know, I really don't. I'm you actually don't. in this part of the okay. world where I have limited ability to carry okay. out. Oh, my library, Nehemiah. Are you seriously asking me that question? I, I've got it on my laptop. So, if, oh, if, yeah. so, so I want to invite people to look at the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of Jeremiah 33, verses 25 to 26, and see how it differs in the Hebrew. And, and I'll just give you the answer because I know some people won't look it up. It's not there. Those two verses do not exist in the Septuagint. And in fact, you can go all the way back to... Um, Jeremiah thirty three fourteen, and then uh, read through twenty six. Those in, that entire section does not exist in the Greek, and you've got to wonder: is this a Greek agenda, or is the Greek text just completely corrupt and and you know inadequate to the point where it's missing? A, what is that like over ten verses? Um, mm-hmm. Good question. Yeah, it's something you know. If you do, if you do what I what I really do love when I'm I can, at least for me when I'm sitting in my little office and I have all my books and library and all that stuff and you can you can take a look at things and you can ask these kinds of questions which I think are phenomenal questions because it it gives you a chance to understand the significance of scripture the, the Hebrew text and how important it is and how how reliable comparatively it is and I, I think that man I, I, I that's just a great example of what you just brought up yeah you know as a place of uh, re- reference man helpful but as, as a place of uh, ultimate authority the original scriptures I mean that's that's just that's got to be where we start, you know. Yeah. We have to start there. So, but isn't that, isn't that interesting that mean. that the you know the the church embraced you know certainly the Greek Orthodox Church embraced this Greek Septuagint that doesn't even have this promise to Jacob, and, and of course there's other verses, so I don't know that that was the exact agenda, but they're definitely no. much more comfortable with the, their version of Jeremiah thirty three twenty five to twenty six, which doesn't exist <laughs> than they are with. We've got to deal with the Jews. Yeah, <laughs> They've exactly. got a legitimate you know claim here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, now, you know, this, this, if, if we can, um, yeah. if we can go to 34 and partly I'm going to just be honest with you, I want to yeah. make a confession right away. What's that? Um, people probably don't understand uh, the stress of, of, of not being able to, 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 to get a recording and, and, you know, you and I, I mean, this is some funny things that, that we catch as far as what we say and during all that stuff. But, you know, one of the things that, that for me is that I'm, I'm a little bit nervous because when we're in the same room together and we're sitting together and we've got our little recording device and we can talk back and forth, it seems that there's a little bit more flexibility. But I don't know at any phrase, any sentence, any period, any exclamation mark where you're just going to say, hello, hello, are you there? (laughs) (laughs) I just have to tell you, I'm under a bit of stress. You know, it's like a witness under a certain stress. You know, they they put a gun to their head and say, now tell us, did you say this? You know, it's like... I'm 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 a, I'm a witness under duress right now. <laughs> Testify, brother. <laughs> yeah. Jeremiah so, thirty-four can one. We, can we start? Well, actually, um, Nehemia, just so you know, it's it's not thirty-four one, and I I, I want you to know it's not going to start not. at Jeremiah thirty-four one. It starts at Jeremiah thirty-four eight. I did an in-depth study on what. Oh, the oh okay, sorry. Prophet yeah, yeah, you're, passages. You're right. You're right. I know you're right. <laughs> okay, no, just kidding. So, but reason I I, I came to the section that um with a little trepidation is uh is that we're going to talk about this issue of slaves and and you know people okay. um people who who you know and again context this is one where context to me is really important let's just let's just jump right into it can we sure in, in verse eight um i'm going to read a little bit then you can read i'll read through up to 11 and then you read in 12 if that's okay sure the word came to jeremiah from Yehovah uh, after king zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to proclaim freedom for the slaves. So we got to stop. Yeah. Because the question that I had right away when I read this, when he says he said he decided to proclaim freedom for the slaves, I'm asking, is is this because he's proclaiming freedom to the slaves? Specifically, is this a jubilee issue? Is he doing it because he realizes that they've gone beyond the the, 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 the time period of when they're supposed to have slaves? Is this a, you know, is he has he been convicted? Has he fallen under conviction? Is there some political reason? Is there a military reason? Like when you read that, when you see that uh, he decided this this proclamation of freedom for the slaves, certainly you've got to know what the answer is for that. What, what, why is he doing that? Yeah. Um, so do, do you have a thought on that or? Well, no. Well, for me, when I read it, <clears throat> the first thing I did yeah. is what we always do is we, you know, go into context and say, OK, where can we find out you know, what's happening here? And, of course, we can go to, you know, Exodus, the parallel passage um, right. in, in the original Torah pearls in Exodus 21. 
um, happens to be the passage which we already did talk about, obviously, in the original Torah Pearls, and I encourage people uh, to listen to that on both uh, on, uh, BFAinternational.com and NehemiahsWall.com, um, where we talked about this this specific passage and didn't, you know, cross over into the prophets uh, very much. But that's the first place where is this, where the, where is the, yeah, excuse me, where there is this clear instruction about what's supposed to happen to slaves. But what hit me was, uh, and we can talk about it a little bit later, but what hit me was that context in Exodus 21 and then Deuteronomy 15, it seemed different. But when I heard proclaiming freedom for the slaves, you know, I'm like, well, is this a, is this a Jubilee proclamation? So let's, so let's, so so here we've got to really dig into what's called the, the, the the distant context, the broad context and the Mm -hmm. broad context Mm -hmm. here. It doesn't start in Jeremiah. If we started in Jeremiah, we, we, we might be left with, um, not, maybe not an answer. Um, yeah. So, or, or not as clear an answer. So we've got Exodus 21 verses two through 11. And, and I apologize to those reading in the English. It might be one verse off. I'm reading in the Hebrew. I'm not going to read the whole passage, mm-hmm. but Exodus 21, two through 11, that has a section on male and female slaves. And then mm-hmm. in Leviticus 25, 39 to, th- to 55 has another section on slaves. And, uh, mm-hmm. and then Deuteronomy 15, 12 to 18. So we've got three different passages in three different books. And, and the truth is that the Exodus passage and the Deuteronomy passage are virtually identical. Um, there's some significant mm-hmm. differences we talked about in the original prophet, original Torah pearls, I believe. Um, <clears throat> but so they're very similar. But then the one in Leviticus 25 is, is, is kind of stands out. And, and it's interesting because wh- which one of these three passages does, does Jeremiah go back to? And, and the only conclusion I can come to is it comes back to all three. And the reason I say that is mm-hmm. it uses language that is clearly lifted out of Leviticus, and it uses language that's clearly mm-hmm. lifted out of Deuteronomy Exodus. Uh, and the language mm-hmm. that's lifted out of Leviticus, that may answer your question or at least suggest a possibility here. Um, mm-hmm. So the what, passage in Leviticus, and we don't have to read the whole thing, um, but basically there it uses that phrase to call uh, freedom, l'ikro mm-hmm. dror, and that's a great word in Hebrew, dror. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. that should be the word of the week. Dalad resh vav resh. It's from the root dalad resh resh, and it means freedom, liberty. Um, and it's actually the word that is translated um, out of uh, um, Isaiah sixty one, and then and then plastered across the Liberty Bell in um, mm-hmm. in in uh, in Jerusalem. Um, you do know the original Liberty Bell is in Jerusalem, not Philadelphia, right? Yeah, um, that's what in, you say, in, yeah. In, Li- in Liberty Bell Park. No, it's, a, it's a copy. <laughs> the real one's in, from Philadelphia. <laughs> anyway, so it says to call liberty, to proclaim freedom. I forget how it's translated on the Liberty Bell, but it's a quote from, is it Isaiah 61, I believe? Um, you mm-hmm. know what I'm talking about there? It's uh, l- Let me mm-hmm. read that verse. Isaiah 61, verse 1. I believe this appears somewhere in the New Testament in the Gospel of Luke as well. But here in Isaiah 61, 1, it says, The Spirit of, of Lord Jehovah is upon me because Jehovah is a anointed me, he has sent me as a herald of joy to the humble, to bind up the wounded of heart, to proclaim release to the captives, liberty to the imprisoned. That's from the JPS, and there the word they translate as um, release is drawer. It's the same word. Um, in the King James, it is um, to proclaim liberty to the captives, it translates liberty, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. So uh, if, we, if we look back at the first time that word appears, um, well, we've got uh, in Exodus. Well, that's not actually connected. But Leviticus twenty five ten it says, and you shall. And this is the King James. You shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty, drawer throughout mm-hmm. all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. And if you read in Leviticus twenty five, and you compare it to Exodus twenty one and, and Deuteronomy fifteen, which again we don't have time to go into in great detail, but basically Exodus and Deuteronomy, when they talk about the Hebrew slave, they're speaking about about the seven-year period, the six-year period of slavery mm-hmm. and freedom on the seventh, Leviticus is actually not talking about that. It's talking about the slave who continues in servitude after the sixth year because he decides to, and then he is released right. at the 50th year. And when it describes mm-hmm. that 50th year release, there it uses this word drawer, this word liberty. Mm-hmm. Um they're in Leviticus 25. And so I've got to believe that these aren't the six-year uh, servants only that we're dealing with, but that they were continuing beyond the sixth year and even beyond the 50th year. And then and then they came along and said, well, wait a minute. We're not following Torah. We've actually turned people into slaves. And, and this is an important point, mm-hmm. which is that um, 
slavery in the Tanakh is not like slavery was in um, in the South and in, in the in the you know Confederacy in the United States. It's more parallel mm-hmm. to something we actually did have early in the days of, of the United States or before it was the U.S. I learned about this in history class in eighth grade. And, and tell me what you know about this, Keith. There were people who wanted to come from England but didn't have the money to do so. And what they did mm-hmm. is they sold themselves as what was called indentured servitude. Um, and they would work yep. for six years and pay, pay off the debt. And then the seventh year, they in in, in the early colonies of the U.S. Um, before it was the U.S. the colonies. And and the seventh year, they would go free, and they would owe no more debt to anybody. They'd be a free person, just as if they're you know, just like anybody else. Mm-hmm. And that's more parallel to what we're describing in the Bible. People who go into debt and to pay off their debt, they sell themselves yes. into indentured servitude. And what was happening? In, um, in 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 the time of Zedekiah and Jeremiah, is that they were keeping these people? They were saying, "Yeah, you work for six years, you're mine now. You're going to be mine forever." And then and then they felt bad at some point and said, "Oh, okay. Well, we know we're supposed to free these slaves, as it is written in in, in the right. Word of God." But then they reneged right. on their promise. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something that the uh, we also I was studying about this this issue of indentured servitude, and, and that people would be there and they would they would make this deal and they say, "Okay, I owe this amount, and so I'm going to do this to get it." Paid. And then they had this issue where they said, well, I don't I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to make it the whole time. So I'm going to try to try to get out of the deal. And in getting out of the deal, what people really don't they don't realize about that is that the people that were in Europe that served the, that, that were becoming indentured servants, what they could decide to do is say, OK, I'm not going to be a servant anymore. And so I'm going to, quote unquote, break the deal and kind of go in and be a part of the population. And no one would be able to tell one way or the other whether this was a person that was used to be a slave, uh, indentured servant or not, and so that became a that became a real big issue in the United States. Did they States have to pay they, for that, or like how did they? Did well, they just no, I'm saying like I'm saying like just imagine this, okay? I, yeah, I, a little off topic, but just imagine. Yeah. So someone you know um, comes over to the United States, you know they're gonna they're, they're gonna sell themselves, to, they're gonna make themselves an indentured servant, and then halfway through they say, you know what, this is just this is not all it's cracked up to be. I don't want to do this anymore, but I want to stay in the United States. I want to, I mean, I want to be, you know, at that point, I want to be in the the colonies. colonies. So they say, and and they say one day, I'm not going to be an indentured servant anymore. So what do they do? Well, I don't know what to do. They they go to another town and and, and, and no one knows, are they a servant? You see see what I'm saying? So that was, that ended up being a really a a big issue. And so they had to be trying Mm, to find out how do you, how can you tell the difference? So anyways, that's, that's another discussion. So how would they tell the difference? What's the answer? They, they couldn't tell the difference. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So then they had to find a different group of people where they could tell the difference. Oh. Okay. Yeah. See, so I was not aware of really that aspect of it. Yeah. 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 You know, so it's a little something to discuss. But anyway, but I want to I want to ask this question. So so are you from from your perspective? You yeah. used the, the word of the week, but you pulled that word from a different passage. No, it's it's from I, verse eight. Correct? No, where you? Where, it's Jeremiah no, thirty four eight. Drawer. Okay. So when we went to to call for themselves okay. drawer to call for themselves liberty. So they proclaimed ah, okay. liberty. So now can you explain? Can, and can then he repeats that, that later in the passage as well. He also says it in verse 15. It says, uh, it, let me read you the JPS. It says in verse 15, Lately you turned out and did what is proper in my sight, and each of you proclaimed a release to his countrymen. You, you called drawer to his countrymen. And you made a covenant accordingly before me in the house which bears my name. And then again, verse 17, it says oh, – oh, I'm going to hold that for 17, though. <laughs> he says it a third time. It's three times it appears. Okay. There it has a different meaning. Right, or so same meaning but different context. The word context. of the week, but yeah. you said maybe it should be the word of the week. No, it should definitely I'm saying, be the word of the week. do you want it? Absolutely. Okay, can you give in a, a little bit slower? Tell oh, me what the word of the yeah. week is. So it's, a, it's the word drawer, dalad resh vav resh, and it, it's made up of from the root dalad resh resh, and it means liberty or release. And what kind of word is it? What kind of word is it? A Hebrew word. You're not going to give him any more technical. I mean, you, you, you've really gone. It's a noun. Honest. I don't know. It's obviously a noun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you need me to tell him it's a noun. <laughs> Liberty in English is a noun too. Okay. I mean, and look, I mean, we're mean? having an issue because uh, we're, we're our Hebrew expert, and and, and, yeah. and you were you were doing uh, the, the 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 reading of the Hebrew, and and come to find out that you you did the Hebrew reading, and and it was the wrong passage in the and and so and so, but you fixed it. You, you fixed that situation, and yet I didn't fix it because I just put it up, and and and, and I kind of find out a week later it's the wrong passage. So I'm, I'm, I'm pushing you on your technical. <laughs> You're our, you're our in-house uh, you're our in-house uh, Hebrew expert. So, but the reason I asked that uh, yeah. is there anything else about the word? 
is that sometimes, and I, I've noticed mm-hmm. this more and more, people yeah. love to get, you know, it, it doesn't have to be overwhelming, you know, it doesn't have to go into great depth, but they like to find out what something is and they can go and check and see what it is. All right, and, so you're pushing me, you know, so now I'll, I'll give you a little bit more of a tidbit. Um, so the word you. drawer also is the name of a certain type of bird. Um, for example, it appears in Psalm 84, 4, where it says, even the sparrow has found a home uh, and the swallow a nest for herself in which to set her young. And um, that word where they're translating as swallow is drawer, the type of bird. Mm-hmm. And then again, Proverbs 26, 2, it has the same uh, same, meaning, same same word referring to um, some type of a bird. Again, it's translated the JPS as swallow. In the King James, they translate it as, um, yeah, also a swallow. Of course, we don't actually know what kind of bird it is. It's some kind of bird that has a nest. Um, <laughs> it's got but, freedom. We know that. Right. And so that's the point, that it, that it becomes this um, image of the bird is f- flying free. It's no longer a captive. Um, and then here we have to ask the question, what came first, the name of the bird or the concept of liberty and freedom? And that's difficult to answer. My the guess would be it would be the name of the bird because Hebrew tends to have it was the name concrete the terms first and then abstract terms afterwards. A bird is concrete. You can see it. You can touch it. Liberty is kind of an abstract term. Um, of course it was the bird. I, Adam I, is the one that first named the bird. And then they, they oh, went from that to the bird. What are okay. you talking about? Of course it's the bird. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, I like it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so we, were, um, we were talking about this. And then it says here, the next verse. It says, um, it says, everyone was, uh, was to free his Hebrew slave, both male and female. No one was to hold a fellow Jew in bondage. So all the officials and people who entered into this covenant agreed that they would free their male and female slaves and no longer hold them in bondage. They agreed and set them free. It's like three, it says it three different times. They mm-hmm. agreed, they set them free. There's a covenant. Just so we're clear now, everybody agreed. And then it says, but afterward, they did something really quite radical. They changed their minds. And uh, took back the slaves they had freed and enslaved them again. What does that picture look like? You know, I mean, I, I, I mean, that seems that seems uh, took back in English seems kind of casual. But I mean, how do you take back unless it becomes a bit um, a little bit more a, a little bit more? Um, oh, I'm I'm, I'm sure I'm sure it involves chains and and whips exactly. and you know and, and and intimidation and and you know mm-hmm. beating people up. No question about that. Yeah, people don't go willingly into slavery. Um, especially when they way you know like so the indentured servant in a sense was was kind of like a contract worker today like he said okay mm-hmm. there, here's what you're going to give me if, if i if i do what for six years okay i'll agree to that but once that six years is up he's not going to stay <laughs> you know as a slave uh you know um willingly and 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 here you know here they're basically forcing people into into and this is really slavery and and can I say this I hope this isn't politically incorrect and if it is I don't care but this is slavery in the african sense meaning this mm-hmm. is what happened in africa there'd be somebody out in the you know in the bush of the kalahari and he was walking around preaching the word of god and then he was just kidnapped and then before he knew it, it was on a boat i mean i don't have to tell you this you know this history better than mm-hmm. i do mm-hmm. um it wasn't that he said, oh, yes, I would like to work for your plantation. <laughs> it didn't work that way, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, right. we agreed that there's a completely different ballgame. And so now we're start, we're actually dealing with something very different, which is not what it was intended mm-hmm. to be. And so here I've got to go to the verse in Leviticus. Can I bring up the verse? It actually appears yes. twice in Leviticus um, where he's talking about this idea of, you know, slavery isn't supposed to be permanent. It's for this you know limited period of time. You've got the six years and the seventh, and if he wants to stay longer, then there's the 50 years. Yep. That's all talked about in Leviticus 25. We, we don't have time to go into that. But then it says um, it says in verse 39 of Leviticus 25, it says, When your brother is impoverished uh, among you and he will be sold to you, you shall not serve him uh, according to the service of a slave. Of a slave. Meaning he, mm-hmm. he can work for you, but don't treat him like a slave. And then it says like a hired worker and like, and like a resident, meaning like a, a landless resident, he shall be with you until the year of the Jubilee, he shall serve you. That's in verse 40 of Leviticus 25. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So we've got this idea that, that, you know, that, yeah, he's going to be your slave officially, but you're, you're going to treat him like you would any hired worker who could walk off as soon as he wants to, um, even mm-hmm. though he can't walk off. And then verse 42, I'll skip it. He says, Ki avadaihem, for they are my slaves or my servants. Servants, who I took yes. out of the, uh, I took them out from the land of Egypt. Lo mim aved. They shall not be sold as the selling of slaves. Don't you know? Even though they have, you know, there's a man who's impoverished and he needs to pay his debt for whatever reason, and he agrees to go into this indentured servitude. Do not treat him like a slave. Treat him like a hired worker. 
And why? Because we are Yehovah's slaves. We are his servants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that that I did think that was, uh, was, yeah, something that that did catch my attention is in Exodus 21, it says that if you buy a a servant in in Deuteronomy 15, it says if you, if you, if a servant sells himself. Mm. So it's almost like there, and I might be, you know, I don't want to go too far into this, but it was like, uh, the the entire range was covered, whether it's buying or selling. In other words, um, right. Well, there there is one know, scenario in in the Torah where a person is forcibly sold into slavery, and that is where a person yes. steals and can't pay back exactly. for his debt. Exactly. And and, and I know exactly. some people listening to this are saying that's so backward, it's so primitive. The Torah forced people who stole into slavery. What do we do in America? We send them to prison. And and this what I'm gonna say now is really controversial, but it's true. Look it up in the U.S. Constitution. Slavery has not been abolished. There are three million slaves today in the United States. Um, that's a fact. Look it up in the Constitution. It says that um, you know when it comes to abolish slavery, it says something to the effect of except as a punishment. Um, and if you go to prisons where people are forced to work uh, and certainly are denied their freedom to leave, it's a form of slavery, um, and it's acknowledged as such in the U.S. Constitution. Um, so think about it. You've got someone who is, you know, committed a crime and he is not sold into slavery. He's sent off into slavery based on a judge's ruling. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I don't know what the solution is. Um, if someone has a fair trial, and, and that maybe that's the key point, that it's a fair trial, um, you know, and society decides to do that, okay, what are you going to do with someone who's, you know, out there murdering and doing other things? Um, you know, uh but let's not be so sanctimonious and say, oh, you know, we're not doing that today. That's what they did in ancient times. We have actually more slaves today in the United States per capita than they did at the time of Zedekiah. And they're it, kept in worse conditions than the slaves were in the co- time of Zedekiah. Um, do you have anything you want to say about that, Keith? Uh, I, they're kept in worse conditions than in the time of Zedekiah. Oh, yeah. Have you been to a U.S. prison? I know you have. You've, you've done prison I, ministry. Yeah, it was just the just – the, yeah. yeah, I mean – yeah, I mean, that's, you know, yeah, I will, uh, yeah, okay. All right, verse 55 All right. of Leviticus 25 goes on, and it says, For ki li b'nei Israel avadim, for the children of Israel are, my, are slaves belonging to me. They are my slaves who I took out of Egypt, from, uh, who I took them out from the land of Egypt. I am Yehovah, your God. And so in a sense, this slavery that we, we, we talk about and we see here in, in, the, in the time of Zedekiah is, is defying Yehovah's kingship. And, and I think that's why they brought those two verses that you insisted on reading at the beginning that should have been at the end. I think the reason they took those two verses is if you enslave another person against his will unjustly, then you are denying Yehovah's kingship and his, his, that he is the master. You're making yourself the master. You're making yourself God and treating him as, as your servant when really we are all servants of the Most High God. And if, and, and if you deny and, and so, so too are you denying his kingship, his godship, if you deny his covenant with Israel. So those two are parallel. I think that's why. So a part of it was, you know, we got to end with a feel-good message. We got to end in a positive note. But also part of it was, I mean, because they could have chosen any two verses to end in the positive note. Why did they chose, choose those two verses? Because there was a covenant here that Zedekiah made. The covenant was that we're going to keep God's covenant that he made in the first place, that we're not going to enslave our fellow human being against his will. Um unjustly and instead uh they violated that and and god's covenant with israel is a similar sort of covenant it you know if you deny that covenant that you're denying his godship and if you and if you enslave people you're, you're denying his godship well I, is I'm that a word what godship? i appreciate it about it yeah no, divinity, uh, divinity i don't know that he's it's a new know, prophet's god. word yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> g-o-d the, the root word. is gd no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's it, when when we go on though um and it says and, and this is where i think what your your point is really mm-hmm. um is driven home because it says then the word of jehovah came unto jeremiah this is what jehovah the god of israel says i made a covenant with your forefathers when i brought them out of egypt out of the land of slavery and i said every seventh year each of you must free any fellow hebrew hebrew slave hebrew who has sold himself to you after you served you six years, you must let then let it go and let him go free. Excuse my uh, blundering. Uh, your fathers, however, did not listen to me or pay attention to me. Recently, you repented, saying, "You know, you did this. You repented, and um, and and did what is right in my sight." Each of you proclaimed freedom to his countrymen. And again, Nehemiah, when I see that phrase, yeah. I, I immediately Drawer. am thinking again of this. Yeah, exactly. the bird flying free. Did I? Did I? Yeah, the bird flying free. Um, 
Uh, do, 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 do. You even made a covenant before me in the house that bears my name. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, like, in other words, this, I mean, you even went so far as to say, I'm going to go before you. I'm going to go before the great creator of the universe, and I'm going to make this covenant. Uh, and, and, th and that covenant was, was acknowledged and accepted, and everyone's agreed. But now you've turned around and profaned my name. Each of you has taken back the male and female slaves you had set free to go where they wished. You have forced them to become your slaves again. And I want to ask this question. It, don't you think, at least, at least for me when I read that phrase, I thought to myself, here's a perfect example where you read over and over again, and maybe you can go on the computer real quick and ask how many times the phrase to profane, to profane my name or profaning my name oh or my name was profaned. Yeah. Uh, while you're doing that, tap, 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 maybe put the two words together, put a little wild card in there, see what you can find as that phrase. Uh, that, that's technical talk for those who don't understand. No, I'm just kidding. So I've no, got approximately 52 instances, uh, or I'm sorry, half okay. of that, well, so 20, 26 in instances. 26 but, instances. Yeah. And here's what's so, here's what's so interesting, Nehemiah, is yeah. that he's, he says he puts the issue of slavery mm -hmm. and going against this covenant as an example or as a clear example of therefore you've profaned my name. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you can go through this a great study. It's a great study, folks that are listening, to go and find the places where the profaning of his name or his name being profaned and what the issue is around it. It's a phenomenal study. But this – is a verse where it clearly comes off the page and says, this is what you did. You went against what you said you were going to do, and now you've profaned my name. So how do Which they profane his name in this verse? What's... Well, no, this is what I'm, this is what I want to do is I want to, I yeah. want to, I want to look at this because it says it went before them and the, the house that bears his name. So it, it seems that in that situation, they would have probably, but what we find out later as we're reading about yeah. the covenant, but yeah. the idea of them, um, uh, vowing in his name, mm -hmm. making a promise in his name, swearing in his name, this is what we're going to do. And he says, so you, you it's like you used my name to make this covenant and then you profane my name by breaking it. Right. So so we really have two two usages of that term and they're really the mm -hmm. same. But um so so I wouldn't I don't like the word profane in this context. I I, I prefer to translate this as to desecrate because that's the reading mm -hmm. of the word lechalel. The chalel is to desecrate, mm. so to desecrate his name. Uh, it's more than mm. just to profane. So to desecrate his name, and, and they did that in two ways. One is they made an oath in his name and then didn't actually keep the oath. And so they, they spoke mm -hmm. falsely in his name. And number two is we have this concept in many places in the Tanakh, in, in the 24 or so, 26 or how many, many verses, that um, where your actions can desecrate his name. So, for example, the first time, one of the first times, Leviticus 18.21, it says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am Yehovah. So, um, burning your child in fire as a sacrifice to Molech is desecrating the name of Yehovah. Now, what does that mean? They didn't say his name while they were burning him, you know, burning their child alive. Um, but by doing so, they represent his name. What you do as Israelites, as people, God's people, people look at you and say, oh, that's one of those Jewish people. That's one of those Israelites. That's one of those people who believes in the word of God in the Torah. And this is how they're behaving. That's a desecration of his name. Um, mm -hmm. So there's actually taking his name in a false oath, like in Leviticus 19.12. It says, you should not so falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God, I am Yehovah. But it's also through your actions, which maybe even don't actually speak the name, but you bear that name through your actions. Everybody who, who you know, behave, who, who lives, um, it, who, who claims to live in accordance to the word of God and, then, and behaves that way is desecrating his name. And then Leviticus 21.6 kind of wraps up that section. It says, um, they shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God, for they offer Yehovah's offering by fire. This is the priest, the food of their God, and so must be holy. So if a priest, a Kohen, does something that's unrighteous, then that, even if it has nothing to do literally specifically with the name of Yehovah, he desecrates that name. Mm. I'm in. Yeah. You know, I got to tell you something. I was reading this, and, and I, I did something because there was a— there's always been this issue, and you, you really brought it up earlier as far as what it, what it meant to, to be a slave in that situation, whether it was buying yeah. or selling. It was according to Torah. The Tanakh is clear about how they're to be treated. And I just thought it was interesting that, 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 it, that like some people would say, well, this is, a, this, is not, this is not a main issue. This is a side issue. This is just one of the many issues that took place. But as we're reading, we find out that this – now, whether it was the, the straw that broke the camel's back <laughs> – 
or, or you know, or the, or the or the reason that the camel's back was broken, um, it's really a big deal. I mean, it it really is a, a major issue. And you said you said it was parallel to the fact that in, in, in by not living according to this this understanding and what he says and how we treat, uh, uh, you know, our fellow our 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 our, our neighbor, if you want to say it, our you know their fellow uh, their fellow their their neighbor their person their friend their 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 brother their sister uh, ended up being the issue that finally said okay that's it it's over you guys are done i mean and i know we're going to get to that but i just i don't know i was it was hard for me when i was reading it's like wow uh is it by chance that it's this one and and how how deep does this subject go how how deep does it go in terms of striking at the core of what it means to be under uh the kingship of the of the great king and how how deep does it go as far as covenant and yeah. promise and swearing i mean it seems like it goes pretty darn deep yeah now, did we read verse 17 yet can we talk about verse 17 no no you're gonna go, you're gonna do it's your turn to read okay <laughs> mm-hmm. um so i'll read you from the hebrew it says therefore thus says yehovah um uh you did not uh, – therefore, thus says Yehovah, you did not listen to me to call liberty, to call drawer, each man to his brother and each man to his fellow. Behold, I will call for you liberty, says Yehovah, <laughs> to the sword mm-hmm. and to plague and to famine, and I will give you for a terror for all the the kingdoms of the earth. Um, and this is kind of like this play on words. You, you won't give liberty to your brothers. I'm going to set free the sword and the and the pestilence, this plague, disease, and famine. I'm going to set that free. I'm going to give that liberty because you wouldn't give liberty to your brothers. There will be liberty, and it won't be a liberty that you like. It will be liberty for these things that I've held back, the sword and the mm. plague and the famine. Um, but I think this is interesting in verse 17 because up until now as we were reading, and we kind of, you know, we were looking at the broad context, but if we'd only read Jeremiah, we might have said, wow, these are such benevolent people. They had the opportunity to hold slaves, and out of the goodness of their hearts, they decided to set the slaves free. That's that You could read it that way, um, at least part of it. But here it makes it really clear. I commanded you to uh, to call liberty. So this was something that God had actually commanded. They weren't doing something out of the goodness of their hearts. They were mm. required to do this. And that's why I go back to the Jubilee. And, and again, it's a little confusing because he said six years and the seventh year set free. Um, so, so why are we saying it's the Jubilee? Because this term here we have in verse 17 of Jeremiah 34, to call drawer, to call mm-hmm. liberty, that is, again, taken from Leviticus 25. It doesn't appear in, in, in the Exodus or the Deuteronomy passage, and that's speaking about the liberty and the Jubilee year. So we've kind of got two issues here. One is the Jubilee and one is, is the, the sabbatical year, the Shemitah year, when, when they would go free if, if they wanted to, and if they wanted to stay, they could you know stay longer, but then eventually they would be set free in the 50th year. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so this one makes it clear that they were required to set them free. It wasn't an option. It was something they were commanded to do. And so they, and so why did they make a covenant? It's interesting. Why make a covenant to do what God already commanded you to do? Can you talk about that, hmm. Keith? That's a great question. That's a great question. So the, so the answer, they, I, they... I think the answer is, is, you know, is human nature, so wait, you know, and it's kind of like this thing. Okay, God commanded us to do something, but no one else is doing it. I'm not going to be a friar and go do it. You know, that's, that's this Hebrew concept of friar. Um, I'm not going to be a sucker and go do what what God commanded if nobody else is doing it. All right, but if everybody comes together and we all agree at the same time, and we at the same time we agree, we're going to press the button and say drawer, liberty. Then, then I'll do it because everybody else is, is, is agreeing to do it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's what happened, that you had the socioeconomic system that was, was you know inherently corrupt. It was based on holding these slaves. And one man may say, oh, I want to set my slaves free. Okay, well, that means I'm going to be impoverished and, and you know compared to my neighbors. And so what they did is they came together and they said, we're going to all set our slaves, slaves free because God commanded us to. And what we're doing is unjust. And then, of course, then they, then they reneged and they took the slaves back. Um, but this was something they were commanded to do. You know, something I, I was reading this and I was thinking, and, and not only, again, the picture, it was kind of surprising. I have to tell you, it was kind of surprising as I was reading this because one, the image, as I mentioned in the very beginning is like, you know, proclaim the, that sounds like a Jubilee. And then of course you brought yeah. up the language issue yeah. and then going through those three passages, but then it goes further and says, you made a covenant. And then it says, you, you made a covenant at the place that bears my name. So now I'm getting that picture. And then it adds one more, one more verse that, yeah. um, that even clarifies the picture more. It says, the, uh, it says here, I w- it says, the men have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me. Then it says, 
I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walk mm. between the pieces. Now, what yeah. does that make you think of? Yeah. It makes you go back to Abraham, you know, where yeah. he's, he, 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 the covenant is made and he cuts the animals and he, and, and, and he walks between the pieces. And we talked about that in the original Torah pearls. And I just thought, man, this is, I don't know, Nehemiah, this, I don't know why, but it's like the image just became 3D. Yeah. Because this wasn't like, you know, okay, guys, okay, we agree. You know, tomorrow the law changes. No, this was an entire. I mean, it was this a was, covenant. This was, so, it so, was a covenant. so it's Genesis fifteen ten is the passage you're talking about, where it mm-hmm. says, and Ab- Abraham took uh, and he took for himself all these, and he split them in 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 the middle, and he put each uh, piece against the opposite. Uh, but the birds he did not uh, cut in two. And then it talks about how he walked between the pieces. So this was a covenant. And, and then here this raises an interesting possibility of why they're doing this in the form of the covenant specifically. And that's because, first of all, a covenant is something that binds you. It's, it's, it really is. Once you make the covenant, mm-hmm. you are bound by it. But also we have this idea in another pl- number of places in the Tanakh, and I think we talked about this in the original Torah pearls, that the covenant wasn't the one-time thing at Mount Sinai and then they were done with it. That we actually see in a number of places in history they renew the covenant And it may be something they renewed on a regular basis. Um, And here, this might not be a new covenant that didn't exist before. It might actually be a renewal of the covenant. And that explains why they took the animals and split them in halves and walked between the pieces. They said, wait a minute, this is how Abraham made the covenant. We're not, this is not a new covenant. This is, this is a renewal of the covenant of Abraham, of covenant with Moses. Um, And we must renew this covenant by doing what was done in in the previous covenants. Amen. and that may be the reason that they split these animals because that, that's, that's unique to two places. It's not unique. It appears in two places in the Tanakh where they, they made a covenant by cutting an animal in half and walking between it. It's Genesis 15 in this passage in Jeremiah 34. And that's, there's mm-hmm. got to be a connection there. There's got to be that they were echoing back to, to that event in, in the time of Genesis. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Amazing. Okay. Well, um, we, we, we've, got a, we've got a couple verses, but I, I have to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in a time machine yeah. um, because it's today – is January, but by the time this comes up, if in fact we make it through, it'll be February. Yeah. Uh, in the middle of February, and and then after that, within a couple of weeks, we will be uh, meeting and trying to go over these passages. Obviously, in um, and you know, over a period of a couple of weeks, we're really going to have to be prepared because uh, we're going to have to do a lot of work, yep. and we, we really do need people's prayer. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. But before we go to these two verses, Nehemia, so what are you doing in the middle of a rainforest that's not a rainforest? Yeah, so you know, I, I'm in uh, northwest, the Northwest in, um, in Washington State, and I, and I originally came here to visit m- with my mother and, and my sister. My mother flew in from Israel, and my sister lives here, and I thought, okay, I haven't seen either of them in a very long time. I'll fly over there, and then I ended up, you know, once it became known that I was here, um, I was, you know, contacted by various people who said, well, would you come in? Would you speak in our, at our fellowship in this place, and would you come and talk to our con-? – so I've actually done – while by the time I'm done here, I'll have done uh, – six different events um, Wonderful. In, in a period of three weeks um, that were never planned in the first place. It really was just supposed to be kind of like some family time. And um, I was, you know, kind of called to do this. I feel like I've been called to do this um, by Yehovah. And, and when people come to me and, and ask me to come teach the word of God, I, I, I respond. And, and so this is what I'm doing out in the rainforest in the middle of nowhere. And I've got to wonder who's going to ever actually come <laughs> out here. And, you know, I have no idea. Like, like literally this is, um, you know, like, and, and on top of that, it's winter. And, and I don't know if you know this, Keith, but before we started the recording, I had to turn off the refrigerator and the heater. Otherwise, uh, you wouldn't be able to hear me because I'm kind of in this little cabin here <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And uh, there's, you know, ambient room noise. And, and um, so, yeah, you know, and, the, and the, you know, my ministry is McCore Hebrew Foundation. My website is nehemiaswall.com. And, and people contact me through the website and they say, would you come and would you speak to our congregation? Would you speak to our fellowship? Would you speak at our church or synagogue or temple? And um, if I'm able to do that, I, you know, and the arrangement is possible, then I, then I do it. And I, I really feel that, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things I, I want to do with, you know, what I want to do is set people free th- with information, you know, is empower people with information and set them free because we, you know, we may not have slavery today, but we definitely have the spiritual bondage that I've seen people all over the world are, are, are subjugated under the spiritual bondage. And, and, and it comes from not having knowledge and um, being forced to rely on other people. And so what I want to do is not just teach people and give them information, but really to empower them with information. That's really what I'm about. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what my ministry awesome. is about. Awesome. 
Well, it's interesting. We're going to be um, t- today, by the time this comes up, mm-hmm. I should be safely back uh, upside down in the earth, having traveled all the <laughs> way down to uh, Namibia, the southern part of Africa, where we'll be able to share people with people and the opportunity just to just to meet with people with people to speak to teach to preach do all those sorts of things but one of the things i'm going to i'm going to do is i'm going to ask folks those that are listening right now rather than going into any, any great depth about it I've, I've decided what i'm going to do is a, an update from these different parts of the world and, and i'm going to make those available right on the front page of bfa international.com so you go to the front page of bfa international.com and it will say catch up with keith and uh catch up with keith you click it and it'll will take you to a, a post where I can actually share um, the information about it. Those that are interested in why I would travel all the way to the Philippines, why would I travel all the way to Shanghai, why would I travel to Africa, why would we travel to a couple other places that are definitely um, out there, and that's because we want to inspire people around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. And sometimes they got really good Internet where people can go to the site. I was sitting down with a man here in this part of the world. I took out my iPad. I had my little MiFi. I clicked it. I went to the page. BFAinternational.com, and this man uh, was looking at this information, and he was blown away that he had access to all that information just right on the Internet. Well, the place that I'm going down in, in Africa, the Internet's about like <laughs> I mean, him and I trying to record worse than, than this. I mean, you can't it's, – it's literally almost impossible to, to have any sort of a, a, an Internet connection where you could download a video or anything like that. And so in that situation, for the last couple of years, we've been in conversation about visiting there, and now the door is open. And hopefully all of that's worked out. There's still a few – details. Um, but again, my hope is that people that are listening right now would just visit bfainternational.com, go to the front page, click on catch up with Keith, and that's going to give you really uh, a, a really good a smattering of information about what the ministry is about, what I've been doing, where it's been going on. And then hopefully, as I mentioned, by the time this comes up, we'll be a couple weeks away from then flying over to Israel. You'll be flying from somewhere you're wandering. I'll be flying from upside down in the earth and we'll meet together and, uh, and, and have a chance to iron sharpen iron with the word of God. And ultimately that's what this whole ministry is about, inspiring people around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. So that is, that is what we're doing now. uh, We've got two more verses in the and I don't know if you want to do a slowdown, but I'm so happy. We haven't, haven't cut this off. I mean, I'm, I'm really jazzed. So you better read, you keep reading because you you seem to have, you you read the final couple couple verses. Go ahead, Keith. Okay. Awesome. It says here. um, Okay. One second. It says, I will hand Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials over to their enemies who seek their lives to the army of the king of Babylon, which is withdrawn from you. I am going to give the order, declares Jehovah, and I will bring them back to the city. They will fight against it, take it, and burn it down. And I will lay waste uh, the towns of Judah so no one can live there. And man, talk about the accurate prophecy. Mm. <laughs> My goodness. I mean, it, yeah. it happened that way, did it not? Yep. We can say that in retrospect, yeah. you know, at the time of Jeremiah, they're thinking, you know, oh, no, everything's fine. We just got our slaves back. We got free workers. Why is he trying to spoil it with all this, you know, with all this discussion? And, you know, come on, what what are you making all this trouble for, Jeremiah? And and what, what we have here is, is you know, one of these examples of, of, you know, I've talked about this before. We talk about this in our book, A Prayer to Our Father on the Hebrew Origins of the Lord's Prayer, that one of the central principles in the entire Hebrew Bible is this idea of midah keneged midah which is literally yes. measure for measure. It's usually translated as reciprocal justice. Um, and what it means is the way you behave, it's the way God's going to treat you. You are enslaving people. God's going to hand you off as slaves to the Babylonians. You think you're going to, you know, you're going to get away with this. You won't. God will bring justice and, and justice, justice prevailed. Justice happened. Um, they wouldn't let their people have liberty. So they lost their own liberty. And that is me. Midah, midah, reciprocal justice. Yeah. And it happened, and it happened. Again, it's phenomenal to read Scripture. And, and the prophets, I have to say, so there's a bit of trepidation, trepidation sometimes when I, when I open up the prophets. And then when I dig in and start opening up the resources that we have access to, and the messages just come out, and they're so beautiful, they're powerful. You know, there is good news in, in the midst of it, and there are, there are positive things, but there's also accountability. And I think that that's what we see over and over again is there's this accountability and then this opportunity and this invitation that takes place. And, and I really, you know, I want to pray, I want to pray uh, uh, today, if we can, at the end, yeah. just because um, I, I want people to, to read the prophets and to be a part of this with us and to, and to then ask the question, what does that mean for me? Uh, I know that's what happens for me is I look at it and I say, so what does this mean for me? And then that's what I love about this prophet, uh, prophet pearls. It's for yesterday, uh, today and tomorrow. Well, today for me, 
um, how can I apply some aspect of this? So if you don't have anything else, I'd like to pray. Please. And boy, I'm, I'm really thankful <laughs> that we made it through. Father, I want to thank you so much for, for technology, the good and the, and the challenge, and, and the fact that we were able to record this uh, this this particular section of the prophets, and we thank you for our, our partners and, and our, those that have come alongside, and especially those that are listening. I pray that they would do as I've had to do, and as Nehemiah's had to do, is to take this word that you've given us and to turn it on ourselves and look at ourselves and ask, what does it mean uh, for me? And certainly, as I read this, I just think about the opportunity to continue to grab a hold of your word and to apply it in our lives and everywhere that we can to love you with our whole heart, mind, and soul, strength, and to love our neighbor. Uh, certainly, this was the challenge here, and as a result of that not happening, uh, the amazing things that, that took place and the accountability that came. We pray for uh, continued um, protection over us and, and uh, grace and peace, and now as we uh, go forward, we just uh, look forward to another opportunity to open your word and to see what it has to say for us today. In your holy name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit NehemiahsWall.com and BFAInternational.com.